To have a good harvest, one must plant good seeds and must also use the right kind of fertilizer. The carrots have grown large and firm. How good they will taste. We're going to have to explain to you guys today why gardeners are really fortune tellers, not future tellers, because I just did that before and it didn't make sense. But um, we're always looking ahead, trying to figure it out. And it's hard when you want to be in the moment, but my head can't be in the moment. I have to always be thinking forward. Do you, do you have this issue, Batavia? I do. I do. I think that, um, you know, sometimes like what, what are your faults? And a lot of people say, oh, I'm an overthinker, which I am as well. But it's like, is that an asset for being a gardener? Kind of, sort of, maybe? I think it is to an extent. Mm-hmm. I think it is. So right now it's the beginning of fall, everybody. Happy fall, y'all. Um yeah, I don't. Know. I almost want to take that bail back, but okay. Yeah, it's a part yeah, of the I process. Fall's a good season. Fall's a good season, but for you, like, where is your headspace right now in your garden? Is it in the present and fall, or are you thinking future already? Oh, I'm absolutely thinking future already. And like how I'm try- far in the future? Like next fall. So because Damn. fall is probably my biggest misstep this year getting you know getting up and running for fall i'm already thinking ahead to how do how do i not be in this space next year right? as long as we've been besties you've been saying every year that fall is your best step just so you know every is year this, is are we three years in as besties it was longer than that give me I, just pretend three or four yeah 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 three or four yeah yeah um i'm well i'm i'm fortunate into where i'm kind of looking into winter but mm-hmm. I'm going to classify that as like late winter. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking into late winter already, but I don't want to miss the season that I'm in. That's the problem I have. And it's, it's, a, it's a battle. It's a constant battle. Well, it's easier for me because outdoors is slower now. Right. You know, and so I get a lot more time to kind of observe and think through things versus do, 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 do. Right. Oh, yeah, you get my point. <laughs> yeah, All no, she I don't does have to take... do everybody. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> if I'm lucky, um, I don't have to take action on so much, right? You know, yeah. and so it gives me a chance. And it's right at the point before the garden gets ugly, ugly. You know, so there's still some level of satisfaction. You know, right. where I can look at kind of the fruits of my labor. Uh, so, so yeah, this is a sweet spot for me. The destruction hasn't kicked in yet. The winter destruction. Yeah, exactly. But it is starting I've, to get cooler uh, where you are, right? Yeah, my mom has officially started the. Do you have socks on yet? And I've my oh, the really? answer is still no. Yeah, yeah, that's the annual query. <laughs> so we'll we'll do this dance for the next couple of months. Um, no, I don't have socks on yet. Um, although I have technically worn socks all summer because I've been we- wearing gardening boots, and that just makes sense. But anywho. Um, yeah, cooler. you're better than me. I can't wear gardening boots. I mean, one, it's a really cute pair. Two, it took me a while to make it part of my garden routine, but it absolutely works. Three, I feel like I am protecting all parts of me outside now. Um, for a lot of months, first, you know, months of summer, I really wanted to go outside in the morning, which I did, and then again in the evening. But the way those mosquitoes were eating me up in the evening. Oh, that's brutal. (laughs) So I have a little bit more protection with garden boots. But anywho, um, cooler nights, cooler mornings, cooler early to late mornings. It's taken, it's it's here. It's taken some time to get warm. That's crazy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The older I get, the faster time flies. I tell you that much. (laughs) And I'm not even that old yet, but I'm I'm getting to where I can't say that anymore. Makes me sad. Um, Before... We dive in to this wonderful subject of fortune telling. I do have to ask everybody, please join us on Patreon or join us on Apple subscriptions and help support the show. And there's a a link down below for a one-time donation if you feel so. And also uh, check out the planter app down below and get a discount. But we'll talk about more like that later, won't we, everybody? Now, as far as looking into the future, it hit me this spring when my what happened my tomatoes were just starting and i was clipping 
I was taking cuttings to propagate for my second crop of tomatoes. And I was thinking to myself, man, I haven't even gotten a tomato yet. And I'm already planting more and just not even really concentrating on these and concentrating on the next season. And it was just, it jarred me for a second. (laughs) And then coming into the summer, it was the same thing. You know, once we got to about August, I started having to think forward because, you know, I start my own seeds. And if you do so, then you really, really need to start thinking ahead. And it's, it's Mm -hmm. hard to do. I think the first using the vegetable as an example, I think onions were the first time this season I could be off, but onions were the first time this season I had the moment of thinking about next year, you know? So I haven't, I bought transplants because I killed the onions. I started from seed way back at the beginning of the year. And so I bought some transplants or, you know, the onion plants. And when I started those things, saw those things started to bulb up, I just got so excited. And I thought about what could be for next year. Right. right. And so I'm pleased with what I got for onions this year. But then it was like, oh, my gosh, you know, a household staple. Right. You know, so that was the beginning of it. And it it wasn't constant. You know, so that would have been like maybe June going into July. It wasn't constant where I was thinking always about the future. You know, it really was kind of planting area, vegetable things that didn't work out the way that I planned. Like those were the signals for me to start thinking about, you know, my crystal ball. Yeah, it's um it's a constant battle because I find when I start starting my seeds, that's really the beginning of it. Like right when cuz we you know, we're coming up into that season now where I in fact will be starting spring seeds within the next month probably. Some of them. And it's like the garden's done and everything's cool and unfortunately I'm completely present in the middle of winter. But I start my seeds and for a time, I'm really focused on that. But then when it comes time to start my next round and my next round and my next round of seeds, you start to see how things change and twist Mm -hmm. and you just got to look farther and farther out. And I get disassociated with it. I would say probably around February, the seasons Mm -hmm. I get disassociated with winter completely, which I'm okay with because I'm not a winter fan. That's not my gig. Um, but you know, I start doing that and then it's spring and then I'm looking into like April and May plantings and it gets over. And then on top of that, you've got to think about your harvesting schedules Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and when things are coming out and then when things are going back into the garden and Mm -hmm. its place to keep it as productive as possible. If that's the path that you see, so choose to to practice. So, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, Onions was a big one for me because they sit in the ground so long, but they come out at a really awkward time. And it's like, (laughs) what do you do in this time frame? You know what I mean? Yeah, I am. I'm still not sure. And next year will be a tester year. So I would say while it was at the very end of my extension services recommendation for planting, like it was like May 15th was is like basically the last date. And that's like when I planted them. I wonder had I planted them early, like what would be my true harvest time for them? Right. right? I mean, I, I could do some simple math. And so for me, it actually worked out where I planted them and when I ended up pulling them. But when I think about what I want to do next year, that's a part of, you know, you know, my my worry about the formulas right you know sometimes things take longer (laughs) than than that's predicted that's you know that's noted on seed packages and such it's in the the garden longer and so that whole shifting something out and then shifting something in it remains a struggle for me it's quite literally a struggle in my garden right now as we record um and i i again i know the answer there this is not the show for that uh but you look back and it does start with starting from seed, but it's something that's very different when your garden is empty and you have that time to focus on starting those things. So I'm not this year that being the exception, I'm not normally tapping out in February, you know, I'm, I'm looking out at emptiness and it's like all of the possibilities are with what I'm starting. 
you know, right. in late January, February, March, like this is the beginning. And because generally beyond the brassicas, most of my seedlings, when I start indoors, do well. And so you have all of this life, you know, that is in my basement under lights. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, so the possibilities quite literally feel endless around that time. When you're surrounded Again. by it too at all times yeah. at, that, at that moment, you're just, co- you're, it's easier too, I think, because you can be hyper focused on the seed shelf and not mm-hmm. be split in between the seed shelf and the garden. And that's where it can get difficult because then you're starting to have to look forward once you start putting stuff in the garden. That's huge. That is split between the seed shelf, the garden, and my indoor plants. You know, God bless them for those that make it through every summer. That one behind you is looking rough. <laughs> yeah. The, I normally, for my work calls, I'll have the um, blur screen on because this thing here, man, I don't, <laughs> it's um, the fiddle leaf fig. And you know, those take, for those that are familiar with that plant, it takes a lot for those plants to grow. And so the growth basically has uh, succumbed to summer Batavia. So anyway, um, what I think about for me in my particular area, during the spring and the summer, I'm up and out of the house every day. Yeah. Right? Um, during the winter, not so much. So I'm a little bit more focused on what's going on in the house, which makes for great seed starting. Right. You know, so again, I have more more of that laser focus. Even still now, this is like the... We're going to go into, I think, the fifth year that I'll be starting the majority of the things I grow from seed. And it still is exciting for me in those first, you know, kind of days of germination. I'm still eager to check on things, you know, every morning, you know. Well, and especially that first thing you, you start. Yeah. The yeah. first seeds you start and then they start popping. You're like, here we go, baby. Mm-hmm, it's on. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And knowing that I am going to be, you know. For a lot of those things, I'm a couple of months. I'm not it's not I'm not waiting until June. I'm a couple of months out from getting them into the garden. That really has helped motivate me, you know. And yeah. so I know that. That's the reason why I'm less concerned about, you know, when I look at my crystal ball those first couple of months of the year, the new growing year, I'm more concerned about your June's, July's, August. That's when the thing like the train comes off the tracks for me. See, and because we're in different areas and different zones, I'm totally different. Mine is from February all the way until April, maybe May is like super intense. Mm -hmm. And then I go basically starting in about June to August, it just gets really lame. Mm -hmm. And I just have to let things kind of do what they're going to do. Everything's kind of done at this point, you know, not done, but everything that's planted is planted and mm-hmm. we're going to let it grow because it just gets so hot that it's hard to get things started. And it's hard to baby them, too, because you're constantly trying to go out and, you know, if, if I started, let's say I direct sowed squash in, you know, a second round of squash in July, which I, I didn't do this year, which this is why. I have to keep them moist. So Mm -hmm. I have to keep my main garden water, but then I have to baby that. But then I've got like, I like to do, uh, I like to propagate plants. That's like my secret, not secret, but that's my passion. And so then I'm taking care of those and I'm getting ready to start seeds of some sort and trays. So it gets to be where I'm having to do like 10 different things. at once. not to mention film a video about it at the Mm -hmm. same time. Mm -hmm. And I'm watering and I'm picking and I'm harvesting and I'm doing all these things. And it it gets very overwhelming. And that's when I can take it a step further. And like this year where I didn't plant my squash and I started looking forward into fall. Mm -hmm. And that's how Mm -hmm. I got a whole bed of Brussels sprouts planted earlier than anticipated. And, You know, my cabbages are all planted and stuff like that. I mean, as of right now, I've got nine garden beds. I've got nine gardens. Um, Man, I'm going to have to start just flipping the script on you and start telling it for myself. I've got (laughs) four and five and a half of those are fall planted at the time of this recording, which is middle of um, September. I still have tomatoes and stuff, but for the most part, my garden's sitting very idle So I'm looking at it and saying, like, when is this stuff going to come out of the garden? Because not only that, I have to plan when to harvest it, but then I've got to plan when to take care of my gardens on top of that Mm -hmm. for winter. 
someone commented um, recently on a video that said something like, um, let's see. I love how you're able to combine the seasons. So this is a video that was filmed in the beginning of September. So what you see in my garden then is quite a few summer plants that are still like looking pretty good. Yeah. Right. Um, And then you have for some of the uh, really spring planted vegetables like that still look pretty good as well. Um, And, you know, had if I'm on it, then you probably would have some fall starts as well in there. But what it made me think about is the blend of summer into fall. So when you describe just it made me think about it in this moment, because when you said half of your beds are fall planted, I started thinking about if half of my garden was like planted recently for fall, what kind of production would I really be looking forward to? Because those four beds are going to be growing and you will be harvesting them for the rest of the year. Right. Right. So the rest of the year from October. In theory. In theory. <laughs> well, I, I don't every- if everything works out the way we want oh, it to. Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay I'm like, look, in actuality, no. So, uh, so from, you know, August, September through the end of December, that's a lot of months, you know, not quite half of the year, but that's a lot of months, right? Yeah. Whereas for me, if I'm planting my fall things, let's say in August, I'm coming up on November. Again, it's similar timing, but it's like a month on either end where my thing is cut off. Right. You know, um, and so I say that to say it makes me pause and say, what does summer into fall really look like for me? And that's not a, it's, it's a box of of worms that I didn't expect to try to open up. And we're not going to talk about it here. But now I'm like, well, let me think about, you know, maybe the struggle I've had with fall recently. It's maybe there's something that I'm trying to be told that I'm not listening for. Yeah. Um, and so when you think about my crystal ball, like I'm shaking that thing up, like it's a magic eight ball. Like, well, hold on. Wait, <laughs> what's really the design, right? You know, like I've never grown cabbage in the fall. I've never grown cauliflower in the fall. I've never grown broccoli in the fall, but everything that I've re- read tells me that I can, you know? And the question is, should I, you know, <laughs> should you, I don't I mean, know. You know, it's it's one of those things, and I've tried this year to really push the envelope in planting earlier, mm-hmm. um, trying to stay ahead of it. And I mean, I think about it, and it's funny because it's exactly what it is. You're trying to stay ahead of the weather. Mm-hmm. You're trying mm-hmm. to stay ahead of yourself. And you're also, if you're gardening like I am, where I'm trying to stay ahead of my family's needs and desires Mm -hmm. for their plates. Mm -hmm. And when you start doing all that, you got to start pushing the envelope a little bit. And that's when you start getting into some experimentation, Mm -hmm. which is Mm -hmm. basically what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and this year I did a lot of stuff with like heat management and planting. And I mean, it was, it was tough. It was tough. I went through way more seeds than I had anticipated just because of the death and, um, you know, heat and stuff like that. But working through that, I've definitely gained some knowledge. And I mean, the truth will be told when the harvest is ready. You know what I mean? If the if the cabbages are ready before February, mm-hmm. then we're good to go. But if it's the same price, same as it was in previous years, like, what does it matter? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? What was it like in previous years? I, harvesting in February. Okay, okay. Basically, you put them in the ground, they grow, they get a little head on them, and then they just kind of sit for about a month mm-hmm. after, you know, around the winter solstice, and then they'll start growing again, then I can harvest. And the goal is to get past that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The goal is to have these vegetables ready when they're su- quote unquote supposed to be ready. Mm-hmm. And I, I threw my hands up and I realized you guys can't see it. And that's kind of the the idea is to stay on top of it because you got to kind of plan ahead for your garden. And I haven't let my garden rest for a couple of years. And I really, really want to give the majority of my garden time to rest. 
so that I don't have to focus on that stuff out there and I can be completely immersed in my seedlings Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. growing more of those. It's just kind of like a toss up. You know what I mean? Because I've got to look into the future and see what's the weather doing. Because, you know, heartbreak zone right here. I mean, we're liable to have a 70 degree day. Christmas Day, guaranteed I'll be in shorts. The day after Christmas, guaranteed I'll have a full blown winter coat on. It's always like that. But so when you're dealing with that and some of these sensitive crops, it can trick them especially the biennial ones into thinking they've been in the ground for two years and they'll go to bolt when they're not supposed to, which seems Mm -hmm. crazy, but that's like a thing. And we, I need to manage that and I need to stay on top of it. So my goal has been this year looking forward to get this stuff in the garden. And so I can pull it out when it's supposed to be done. And then I can kind of move forward in the right direction in the direction that I see to be the right way. Yeah, there's something about the, you know, kind of frost free days is one thing, right? You know, um, but optimal growing days and time is a different yeah. thing, right? You know, and survival so, versus thriving for yeah. a plant. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. And when I think about this, I think that generally I've been more apprehensive about like, oh, I'm a, I was chatting with a a gardener, Chicago based gardener, um, which is going to be one of your best, you know, kind of notes to make what someone else is doing in their garden that's in your area. And I was watching her when she was harvesting peppers from the garden. I can't remember the time frame, but I remember watching it and saying, wow, that feels early. And then I asked her, Like, when did you plant your peppers and tomatoes? And then, you know, in her reply, she also noted when she started them. And I'm like, yeah, that's, um, you know, that seems to be about on par with what I want to do. Not necessarily on par with what what I've been doing, you know. And so I look at it now and we've had this conversation, you know, September going into October. I, I have some lush pepper plants as the example. Um, and a lot of peppers on the plant, right? And so then I go back to that question of how much could I have gained if I would have had these in the ground and growing earlier. Now, we're not even going to mix in the way weather works, but that's the reason why I'm talking to someone that's in Chicago, right? Because they've had the same weather that I've had. Right. Um, and so I look at, I say that, you know, this year she likely took advantage of some of the, like the oddness of the weather, but it played in her favor in her garden. Whereas I was like waiting out and seeing, and it's wild because you think about how many pepper plants as the stars that died on my deck that I didn't even plant this year. And I'm worried about like, what happens if the frost comes in and kills them? Like you'll plant the rest of them that are in the basement. They're yeah. still waiting for a home. But anyway, um, I think that as I kind of go into reflecting on the year and then thinking about what's going to happen going into the new year, I oftentimes think about, you know, the timing of it all and the timing of it all with the idea of getting, taking advantage of as much of the growing season as possible. Like that's in theory, (laughs) but I don't know that I'm often doing that. I don't know if that's my actuality. You know, I know it's not my actuality. Let me say that. I think part of looking into the future is being flexible too. And I mean, look, humans are creatures of habit. Mm -hmm. You know, the sun comes up, you wake up, sun goes down, you go to sleep, same things. And look, if you think I'm kidding, go camping or go without power. When that sun goes down, your ass is going to bed Mm -hmm. because there ain't nothing else to do. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, And that being said, it's the same thing. Like we know... When we live in an area for a certain amount of time, you know when it's going to get warm. You know when it's going to get cold. And learning to look forward for that. And it's just, you know, I'm imagining that the person you were talking to was probably a little bit more flexible with their planting because of the weather that was impending and maybe had some successes that you didn't have. Is that the case? It seemed like that's kind of what you were alluding to. Yeah, I think more of it's... Um, not saying you're a failure. No, of course not. No, no, no. I, I didn't interpret it that way. No. Okay. Um, success in the, you know, you're waiting on some vegetables to be ready to pick. 
And she's, I mean, I'll look back, I'd say minimally three weeks, maybe even a month. The difference between, and we're, let's, let's use green peppers. I even talked about fully mature peppers. Uh, she was harvesting so- peppers that were the size before I was. Right. And yeah. I look at this and say, and a month is a long time in a growing season. And I also look at this to say, well, if I'm starting to harvest peppers in August and she's harvesting them in July, like that's something I want. Right. You know, so she was successful in that way where I wasn't. Um, I think stuff like that, it matters to me, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's important to do that. And it's like this year I went to go start my, um, what was it? I started, I know dead Aaron podcast, my bad, everybody. <laughs> I think it was my collard seeds. Yeah, I'm looking at a tray of dead collard seeds. And I um, I started them early because I knew that the weather was going to, it it was cooling off, it seemed like. Mm-hmm. And I didn't look far enough ahead and bam, it got hot again. And when I say hot, I mean, it was in mid 90s again for two, three weeks. Mm-hmm. You can't do anything with a fall vegetable at that time. So I'm continuously looking forward. And now that I've got bees, it's the same thing. I have to look even farther forward in the winter time mm. uh, to take care of them appropriately, which is a whole different thing. But, um, you know, it's just one of those things where it's like I want to get into that space. But I also have this dilemma where I really want to be present in my spring garden and really thoroughly enjoy it. But I find myself because of my growing area to be a little nervous and really on top of things because of the impending heat that comes in. And this goes for fall, not just spring. It's the same thing. Like we'll have impending heat all the way through Um, probably October. You know, I would say Halloween can be unseasonably warm Mm -hmm. more times than not, you know, in the upper eighties. And that's really hard to get a garden going and get it, kind of flourishing the way you want to have it but if i look forward and i'll wait for it then i can add shade as needed i can water as needed you know i'm right on the cusp right now where i'm debating cutting back my watering because it's cooling off and i don't want my ground just to be saturated all the time Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. i'm kind of i'm starting to get into that mode but i've been thinking about this for weeks and i think think this is a key to success in a garden though I think I went to look quickly and it looks like um, June 21st, so like the first day of summer, um, she wasn't harvesting peppers, but she had like, you know, kind of your either sweet or hot, probably sweet peppers, your long kind of bullhorn like peppers. So they won't take as long as to produce as a um, as a bale, you know, and I don't know. I mean, maybe I could look back and find I don't know that I've ever had peppers on plants before the end of June. I mean, by then, my plants have just barely been in the ground six weeks, right? You know, so I I say that to say, like, that's a part of the formula. So it pains me every time I look at peppers in the end of the season that have buds on them. I know that the plant's going to die, you know, and I think about how much more there could be. So that's just a note there. When you talk about your spring versus, you know, I think there's a difference in what your spring garden produces versus mine and types of vegetables, you know, um, by the time you're in spring and the calendar actually says spring and I'm just barely getting planted for spring, you're harvesting vegetables. Right. You know, so that absolutely makes a difference because you've been out in the garden much longer than I have. Um, and so I want to make that distinction just from the, the different listeners that are in different growing areas. Right. Like my dance that I do is not the same as yours. When it comes no. to the risk associated with, you know, look outside, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's 95 degrees coming down in North Carolina. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, spring in 2024 is March 19th. So on March 19th at my garden, I will have fully planted every single thing that is cold tolerant. So that would be cabbages, broccoli, cauliflowers, spinach, radishes turnips you name it kales all that stuff if it hasn't already been in the garden all winter lettuces at the same time i will start around that time hardening off all of my tomatoes so the month prior 
marks when I start planting my cabbages in the ground. So February 15th ish is when I start planting my cabbages and broccolis in the ground a month after that, those plants are just starting to take off Mm -hmm. and I'm already getting my summer plants, some of my summer plants ready to harden off and really starting. And I mean, I'm, I'm not even going to use this word loosely obsess over getting them out there at the right time so they can be hard enough. Cause I mean, you have to remember not only am I growing them for myself, but I'm also selling the seedlings. Mm -hmm. So I'm getting, trying to get them so they're appropriate height and you know, strength and hard enough to be able to catch the market at the right time. But I base that on my garden too. So whenever I put them in is whenever they become available roughly. And at that time, you know, so all of this stuff is happening at once and you're trying and spring actually is, is very hard on me. And then fall is a total opposite because I have to make decisions at this point of what can I pull out of my garden to put into my garden. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I have to manage the heat along with the lowering of the sun, the lower angle of the sun for the time of year. And it's a big difference. It's a huge difference for the garden. And it, it's very hard to manage. What was the first day of spring again? For March 19th at 11.06 p.m., I believe. The only thing I've ever had in the garden at that time was spinach, which volunteered from last year overwintered. And a couple of years I've gotten peas into the ground. Yeah. Maybe maybe snow peas. It could be like sweet peas. Um, But I'm not even considering putting vegetables in the garden at that time. Now, generally speaking, when you talk about, you know, two to three weeks before your average last frost, Everything the experts are saying is that I could be, you know, with the big asterisk of if your ground is workable, I could still have a garden covered in snow, you know. So that's, I mean, if that's not the clearest difference between the two of our growing areas, I don't know what is. Yeah. And I mean, this year with El Nino, they say that we may actually get some snow. I'll believe it when I see it. (laughs) But even then, it's only for a day and Mm -hmm. it kind of is what it is at that point, you know. But as we get into winter, and you live somewhere like I do, you have to also be looking forward in the future as far as when to cover, when not to cover, mm-hmm. when to treat, when not to treat. That's a huge one. Mm-hmm. I know you don't really treat much. You you rely on covers, but like I treat with organic sprays, keyword organic. Um, and I am constant. you know, when you spray, you, you want it to be dry for a couple of days afterwards. Mm-hmm. You don't want it to be heavy dews or anything like that. So you've got to be looking forward to that. And if you're overhead watering, you've got to think about your watering schedule. And it's all these different things that line up that keep us constantly looking forward. But again, I go back to the thing is once we learn how to do that, I feel like that's one of the keys to success in a garden. And that's one thing, like if you ever talk to an old timer farmer or anything, they'll, they'll tell you triggers in their mind that tell you like, Hey, something's about to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like for us, this isn't even gardening related, but the last full moon in September marks the beginning of the spot fish run in our area, which is a, big time fishery in our area so whenever that last full moon is we know that it's going to start soon and just things like that you know what i mean that we learn over time you know the leaves turn is starting to turn like there's a tree in my backyard i just had a video come out about this and it's the first one to turn colors (laughs) at all and usually it's not even pretty it just the leaves fall but as soon as i see that fall i know that it's time to start gearing up to make compost for the winter (laughs) <laughs> and okay, that's one yeah. of those triggers. So for I'm looking winter? forward. Yeah, because I okay. build my compost pile through the winter mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then I just run it through the summer. Uh, there's more to be said about that on Sandy Bottom Homestead if you guys want to go watch it. But I'm not going to get into that on this channel right now. <laughs> In the future, we'll be talking about compost, I believe. Yeah. Uh, kicking and screaming. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh- <laughs> I was just going going back to the idea of like kind of getting out of the gate. I was looking at my planting guide for Illinois and I was just trying to do a visual of how many things it, you know, notes to start 
to actual plant in May, excuse me, in March. Uh, and it's, I, I hear your voice saying, you know, it's almost completely planted out. My garden's almost completely planted out. You know, so you have nine beds that are almost completely planted out. It's wild. You know, I may have nine vegetables, maybe, you know, and yeah. so rhubarb being one of them, you know, so who's planting that? No, <laughs> I know some people do. Um, so it's, it's interesting to me because when I think about your winter versus mine, you know, like what we're thinking about, let's take a step back your fall versus mine. So what you're thinking about now will differ greatly from what I'm thinking about because I'm still harvesting tomatoes, you know? Um, And so that takes up some space in my brain where I'm not focused on whatever the next thing is. Right. Um, And then you think about kind of going into the winter and there is a certain harshness that my winter, you know, same thing when you're in new England, that my winter kind of puts down on us compared to yours. Right. You can likely I mean, it's an still unplantable barren at that mm-hmm. point. It's an unplantable barren. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wasteland. Uh, you could even still work comfortably work on some garden projects in your winter, yeah. you know, um, and that's actually one thing I want to touch on as I look forward to next year. I think my garden projects are very, 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 Hold me to this, guys and gals. Limited. You know the joy that saying those words and all those varies bring me? This garden yeah. year was really heavy on garden projects, and it took its toll on me. And based on that, I look at next year and say, like, I have a clean slate. Like, this also is going to influence how I close out my year, because I could really hit the ground running coming into next year. And that's super duper exciting to me. Yeah. You know, um, and so, you know, if some stars align, I don't know, it could be a banger year. Uh oh. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Hopefully they align for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, winter is super focused on garden projects. And my goal, my goal is to always have them done around March and they always bleed into like May. Mm-hmm. It's like at the worst, I'm like, oh, wait, I need to do this. Oh, wait, I need to do that. And if I could just get it done and move on, I'd be all right. But it doesn't work that way for me. It never, yeah. ever works that way for me. I was out in the garden this weekend and it was like 60 something degrees. And I was just like, oh, this is just so comfortable you know, <laughs> in comparison to. And I'm like, why is it that I choose to do the most work in the garden at the hottest time of the year? That doesn't quite does that make sense that I'm reminded that I despise the cold so much like that's yeah. another place you're dragging me kicking and screaming is out you know in those early spring days to get projects done so so before we move on to the listener question of the day let's think about if let's say that there's somebody listening to this that is not looking forward like that mm-hmm. what are some areas in which you think somebody could look f- like help them to kind of look into you know the crystal ball moving forward in their garden what are some things that somebody could look at you think i think the first couple of things are vegetables that either you didn't plant this year that you want to plant you know you want to grow or vegetables that you planted this year and perhaps they didn't do what you wanted them to do wow your answer is totally different than mine that's awesome Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah mine would be um i think one and i mean Everybody take a shot. Weather, you know, Mm. temperatures, stuff like that, depending on where you are. I mean, like in your area, it doesn't really matter because it's just going to get cold (laughs) and it's going to stay that way, you know. Mm -hmm. But like if you're in a more southern area, I think you can definitely use that to your advantage. And two, I think it's important understanding um, planting dates versus, you know, for cold tolerant versus heat tolerant and stuff like that Mm -hmm. because you got to figure out when to get that stuff out of the garden i think a lot of times you know when i first started gardening i was really focused on when things were going in the ground but not when they were coming out of the ground Mm -hmm. and that was a big downfall like i missed a lot of like good production for quite a few years over that and now that i've kind of gotten a more of a grasp. I don't want to say I have a grasp on it because I definitely don't think I do, but more of a grasp on it. I think I'm starting to see more production coming out of my garden because I can flip these plants in and out sooner. When you say coming out of the garden, you mean like kind of your spring crops when you're harvesting them? 
Yeah. I mean, if mm-hmm. those are the easiest ones because they're, you know, one and done. So mm-hmm. when is that head of cabbage going to be done? Mm-hmm. You know, or more importantly, let's say you're going to put um, and don't take this as advice because I don't even know. But like your tomatoes behind your cabbage. Is that cabbage going to be in the harvestable? If you put your tomatoes in on April 15th, typically, are you going to be able to harvest that cabbage before then? Or is it going to bleed over into May, June? I mean, look at you. When did you harvest your cabbage? You, I mean, you're still harvesting cabbage, aren't you? My first car, uh, my first cabbage was harvested in late July. Probably could have been mid, maybe early July. But I didn't. I planted them April 15th ish. So three months later is when I would have been yeah. harvesting them, which actually goes back to the top of this when we started talking about what you're doing in March. So the question becomes, if I would have planted those cabbage plants three weeks before my average last frost date, which is mid-April, would I have been able to harvest those cabbage in June? And in your scenario, again, you said, don't quote you, like, in my brain, if I am, that's still too late to be planting tomatoes. Maybe that's, maybe my beans go behind it. Gosh, we could spend another two hours talking about this. Yeah, there's a whole episode there, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Stay tuned, everybody. Coming (laughs) real soon to a podcast near you. Yeah, I I think um, that's a whole thing is like planting. What's the term when you plant behind something? Not like the same crop, but a different one. I don't right? know. It's just replanting. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Leonard. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Leonard don't know. He don't know nothing. So, I mean, it's it's just food for thought. Mm-hmm. Look into the future and see what you can find. But before you do that, this is definitely going to help you look into the future when you get the planter app. The planter app is to design your gardens. It's a square foot interface, drag and drop, super easy. As a matter of fact, everybody already have a garden planned, rough plan for next year. It has thousands of varieties, um, hundreds of plants you can choose from, custom. You can get anything added to it. It gives you growing guides, planting dates. All of this helps with everything that we've just talked about. It gives you companion versus combative planting, which is extremely helpful. You can use it on your phone, your tablet, or your PC. It's super useful, great for planning, have multiple profiles, custom guides for everything that you do. Check it out. It's the Planter app. Link is below. Gives you a discount. And it's available on Apple and Google. And that's the P-L-A-N-T-E-R app. The Planter app. We love it. Use it. There we go. I was waiting for the bell. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Have we decided if we're going to do a uh, planter app garden design on YouTube? I think we decided, but we were trying to figure out if YouTube could handle us. Yeah, YouTube doesn't know how to handle us. I think we've <laughs> already figured that one out. Yeah, so at some point we may end up doing that. Probably two sessions, one for Batavia's garden, one for mine. But we'll figure that out. Mm-hmm. But our listener question of the day comes from Spotify. And this is from DJTA. I'm going to have to pass this off to um, Batavia because she's she's a local expert. Best soil and time to harvest corn container or in the ground? What is what is it you say? Because I can't grow corn to save my life. We fit in a starve around here. I was meant to Google uh, saving corn seed because I walked past when I was going to the garage yesterday. I walked past a whole ear of corn. And I'm like, well, shoot, I didn't see that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a variety that I would like to enjoy. I think I use the last of the seed. So I'm like, but anyway, um, that one is. I am really torn. Um, if you have the space in a garden bed, I'd say that should be your first choice, growing it in a garden bed. I have seen people grow corn in containers successfully. Um, I think I, I'll i have to direct you to Google 
because I saw a pretty succinct response. I think I Googled something like, you know, when to fertilize corn. And they gave you like four periods. First, when you're planting, maybe at like the four week mark, maybe at the eight week mark. I can't remember exactly. Um, so I think I'm going to add that to the answer. Like it's not only the soil, uh, but it's also when you're feeding the plants. Um, and I think because you're able to better control water in a garden bed than you are able to in a container, and I'm a huge container gardener, um, that's just, that's just, you know, fact. Um, that's the reason why I'm leaning on, um, growing in a container, excuse me, growing in a garden bed. Um, did they say type of soil like sandy versus not? Is that what they're asking? I don't know. I would assume. I don't know if I've ever I mean, read anything or had any experience with like corn grows better in this soil versus not. I can tell you that I have book smarts, but not street smarts about corn. <laughs> and from what I know, and I, I do know why my corn crop failed this year. And we'll get into that into our ceremonial episode at the end of the year, probably. Mm -hmm. um, it loves water. So... I almost think that you cannot overwater corn from what I've read and what I've seen. It's very hard. So I would imagine you'd want more of a moisture retentive soil. Uh, and if you're doing it in a garden bed, it doesn't mean add, it just means mulch, you know? Um, and the one thing I'll say about container versus in ground is, and I do know this to be fact because this was part of my problem was um, pollination is key mm, mm -hmm. for corn and you just can't get the numbers of stalks required to get decent pollination i mean you can but it's hard in a container you can get more because you know i was planning um my mom wanted popcorn grown have you ever grown popcorn i haven't holy smokes that was so cool 100 percent grown popcorn next year <laughs> and um I, I went over there you know my mom's got some issues she can't really work in the garden so i plant her garden for her and i was like all right mom how much do you want of corn she's like i just want one or two plants i'm like you you can't mm -hmm, do mm -hmm. one or two plants you've mm -hmm. got to plant it in a block mm -hmm. and so she had we did a four by four block and um she did not get great pollination but she did get popcorn ears and uh, mm -hmm. it's just like getting popcorn out of the bag. It's crazy. I don't know why I was so shocked, but I was definitely <laughs> shocked. And, um, yeah. you, you know, if she would have planted, allowed me to plant a whole bed, I imagine she would have had better pollination and better growth. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. the pollination is what determines how many kernels you get on an ear. Right. Yep. And the you could always hand pollinate. Uh, if you are growing in a container and you're thinking you may be challenged that way, I just know me and I just, yeah. I know I'm not that disciplined. Um, so I tried to grow corn in containers last year and sometimes I do really well in containers. Other times I don't. Um, if you look back and talk about plants that need kind of consistent watering, uh, if a plant needs consistent watering, I struggle with it in a, in a container. Because I have a good, I get out of the gate pretty good, and then things kind of fall off depending on the year. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that um, I am a big fan of growing. I grew corn in small spaces. It was a whole series that I did on, um, you know, like through shorts and reels. And I still stand by that. Um, nearly every stalk that I planted produced an ear of corn. They were varying sizes, which I look to be more of how I fertilized or that mm -hmm. how rich that soil was. Um, and I probably, every ear was pollinated with the exception of maybe the first three or four rolls on some, like if you kind of go around as a row. Um, so I think generally speaking in a super small space, I was able to get pretty good germination. Um, yeah, but I like think it. that. Hmm? It sounds like it. Yeah. I think that corn in general, like it's, it's similar to potatoes for me in that it's taking me multiple seasons to really fine tune like what success looks like for corn. Right. Um, and 
I think it's super cool, like to be able to go out to the garden and harvest an ear of corn. I'm also recognizing that corn doesn't exactly work that way. Like if you're planting a whole four by eight bed, a lot of it's going to be ready at the same time. So I kind of have to balance that bit as well when it comes to me growing. Um, You know, I would like to do a whole episode about corn. No good grief. I'm just, it's fascinating. Wait, is this thing still recording? Oh shoot, I didn't realize that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and I mean, because as you, as you get into it, it's like, it's one of the, if not the most grown crop Mm -hmm. in the entire world. Mm -hmm. And it's well known that it just sucks the soil of all the nutrients. Mm Mm-hmm. So it's a super heavy feeder. Onions are very heavy feeders as well, but we're not talking about onions right now. And um, I know that there's been some studies done and people that they use synthetic fertilizers Mm -hmm. and then there and then in the control group, they did um, organic fertilizers. And what they found at the end of it was the organic fertilizer bed had more nutrients left in the soil after the corn was harvested. Mm hmm. But you've got, just like with onions, you've got to consistently push nutrients to it. And the differences, and depending on what you use, is, you know, determines how much you need to fertilize. But I think, like you said in the beginning, fertilization is key. And then water is key, too. Because, I mean, the kernels are nothing but water, basically. Mm -hmm. So you got to plump up the kernels. Yeah, and I think that the other side of it, which wasn't asked... Um, was, you know, it's the harvest time. And again, I think that just comes with experience. Yeah. And it's also variety. Yeah. 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 Which, you know, it's that, that bit of like, um, just tell me which variety to grow, garden gods. You know, yeah. <laughs> like, um, I was watching another uh, YouTuber, a gardener on YouTube that uh, grew the same variety, the golden batum. I think that's how it's pronounced, sweet corn. And I didn't follow her close enough to know, like, oh, did she check off this and check off this when she grew it? But none of it was sweet when she was processing it in her kitchen. And I was like, oh, that kind of sucks. You know, <laughs> like, and I've had mixed results when it comes to that variety. And quite literally, I still have seeds from it. And that's the reason why. Actually, no, that's not true. I used all of the seeds from that variety. And then this year when I said, oh, I have another space to grow corn, I was like, okay, what do I order? You know, it was so yeah. late, you know, I'm like, all right, fine, this will do, you know. Um, and so, so yeah, variety for sure. I, I like the idea of popcorn, obviously completely different experience when it comes to you enjoying it because, you know, you're just waiting for that thing to dry up. Now, the question was when to harvest corn. Um, and that's oh, a tricky uh, yeah, one. Can, yeah, sorry, I could touch on that. Um, yeah. so, so harvesting corn, as I, I did mention about it being kind of almost a science. Uh, so there are things out there that say X number of weeks after the tassels are formed, the corn will be ready. I'm saying X because I don't know the number off the top of my head. So you can Google that if you're interested. Um, but signs that the corn is ready, the corn ear will be plump because those kernels will have plumped up so you can actually touch it to feel if it's plump uh, the silks which are kind of the, the things you see they're coming out of the ear they may start off as a color of like you know a light uh, off white they may mind some of mine depending on the variety are kind of reddish once those things dry up and it's more of a darker brown that's a signal that the ear of corn is ready to harvest and then this is the it's a little bit touchy because if you don't get the timing right you know it can impact your enjoyment of the corn a surefire way to determine if it's ready to harvest would be piercing so pulling back you know the the husk a little bit just a little bit piercing one of the kernels and if there's a watery substance it's not quite ready if it's a milky substance it's ready. That's that sweet nectar that you enjoy when you eat corn. Now, the issue is if you pull it back and then, you know, it's not quite ready, you've basically injured that particular kernel. And so that's not going to be tasty whenever it does get ready. You can basically um, kind of repackage that corn. So don't worry about that bit of it. Um, and then you have a clock when it comes to when it's going to be at its prime, you know, as far as once you do harvest, you know, two to three days is the best time to enjoy that corn after it's harvested. Yeah. And also I will add in that depending on if it's super sweet, sweet, 
or whatever, you get a grace period. Mm-hmm. So the there's like period. a there's a fine window, and I, I think it was a super sweet. You get more of a grace period of when you can harvest like a ten day period mm-hmm. to get that maximum flavor, and then your you know your standard ears of corn. It could be like a matter of days before you can get it. So it you know if that's why I picked a super sweet to try this year, um, and I actually did and. Instead of piercing one, when I thought was going to see what was going on, I just pulled the whole ear off and ate it raw. Mm-hmm. Man, it was delicious mm-hmm. right off the plant. I, I think I'll be doing that every year. But um, I picked the super sweet because it gave me a grace period because I was, I was like, I don't need to be concerned. I mean, I would be super bummed if the entire bed was overdone and not good. Yeah. And the other way to know if it's too, if the, the kernels are sunken in, you know, you've missed the window. If they're yeah. on the ear and they're sunken in, which again kind of sucks. Now the benefit of growing corn is it's super cool. You know, a lot of us enjoy it. I know some people prefer not to have it in their diet, but I su- sure do enjoy it. And having it in your garden is awesome. Now, will I grow enough corn for like what I really want to fold into my diet? Probably not. Um, you know, that kind of goes back into you know you have corn farmers. You know, <laughs> there's a reason why they are focused on a particular crop. Um, I do think it is, if you've not grown it, I do encourage you to find some space in your garden and give it a try and try to take some of the notes that we've shared here forward. Definitely do some internet searching, read up on it, you know, go to some trusted sources, like be prepared because I wouldn't describe it as an easy crop. No, from what I understand that once you get a hang of it, it is easy. It's just getting a because you know I'm three years in. The first year I just planted like a couple kernels. The mm-hmm. second year I maybe planted a couple more, and then this year I planted a whole bed. Mm-hmm. But I still just I, I missed the mark. Um, I had bad germination, and everything just kind of came at the wrong time, so I could not get pollination. Mm-hmm. So moving forward, I know what to look for, but you know this year was a big learning year for me. Um, but I, I do agree with you. It's from what I've experienced, which is very limited. It is not easy. And but what I from what I understand, once you get a hang of it, <clears throat> it is is really easy once you figure it out. And I had a friend of mine who recommended a specific corn. It's called a G90 hmm. G90. And he said when he grew that he had the most production he'd ever had in his entire garden. Oh, wow. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, think about that. I don't know why it's G90. It's probably a hybrid of some sort. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But um, I mean, if you're not worried about saving the seeds or whatever, and you just want to try something, he said is super productive. And he had like full germination, full ears of corn, all the way up and down the stalks. And you know, I think a lot of the stalks had two ears on them too, which makes it better because you get more corn for yeah. the work. But um, I'm I'm gonna look into that. Yeah, I'm on the internet. Damn you. I was pretty much set with, you know, the varieties that I was going to add to my list next year. And there weren't many. But it's hard to to look away from super productive. <laughs> yeah. Well, and apparently there's um, it's easy to get a lot of places have G90 mm-hmm. corn mm-hmm. and it's a sweet corn. So that means that you're going to get that kind of that grace period of for harvesting. Mm-hmm. So maybe I'll do G90 corn next year. Uh, hopefully, I think after this year, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do two plantings of corn. So if I fail the first time, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to fail twice in one year and just make it a world record. How many times <laughs> in a year can you fail at a crop? Ben's going to tell you. That's interesting because corn is one of those things where the window to grow it is generally pretty long for a lot of people. Like it's not yeah. the full season, um, but you get like there definitely are people that commonly do first and second sowings of corn. I think yeah. for me, it's as late as like July the 4th or something like it's right around Independence Day as far as how late I can plant it, you know, for it still to produce that season. But that could be my second sowing. Um, I just found I'm looking up this G90 real quick for everybody if they're curious. It's a treated seed. So it's treated with something if that bothers you. Mm. I don't know what it's treated with. I have to look into that. Like I said, I don't know a whole lot about it. 
So there you go, everybody. If you'd like to leave a question, you can do so on Spotify. We cannot answer you on there, which is what started this whole shindig. <laughs> but you can also leave it on our Facebook group at Community uh, Backyard Gardens Community Garden. Super long name. Just go there. Or Patreon or anywhere else that we can see comments, any one of our YouTube channels. If you do want us to answer it, you go to either Be Better Garden YouTube channel, which is Batavia's or Sandy Bottom Homestead, and it's mine. Um, somebody put on one there one day Spotify question, and we knew what it meant. So go ahead and just do that. Other people on YouTube be like, what? But we got you. It's a secret code. You know what I'm saying? And on that note, everybody, continue to learn to grow and grow for change. See ya. Now you know why people feel like celebrating at harvest time. All over the world, people have feasting and good times when the crops have been gathered in. Thanks for checking out the show. If you like what we're doing and you'd like to support us, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash backyard gardens, or you can be an Apple subscriber. And in both of those, you'll get an extra episode every month. You can also make a one-time PayPal donation with the link below, and you can get all kinds of gardening gear, like t-shirts and mugs and cups from the link below at Teespring, and we have an Amazon store which has all the products that we use and recommend in our gardens, and it helps support our show. And we also add to this list periodically, so be sure to check it out periodically to see if there's anything that you need for your garden. Everything that you do, including a like and a subscribe and even a review, will help us learn to grow and grow for change. See ya.